afternoon in different time zones, evening in Australia, Justina and others that are joining us from all over the world, mainly Europe um, for this Zoom meeting. It's fantastic to see again many friends, familiar faces, but also unfamiliar faces that are joining us for the first time in this Zoom meeting uh, of the European Festivals Association. Very warm welcome. I do a brief introduction and then I give over the word to the moderator, Sophie uh, and to Christina, uh, to guide you through this session. Just a couple of words from uh, the European Festivals point, uh, Festivals Association's point of view of why we do these uh, sessions with festivals and cities. Um, because we believe that festivals and cities are Siamese twins. The need to experience the arts and culture together the need to assemble motivated societies, open and urban and regional communities to join together in celebration of life and creativity. IFA is convinced about the importance of mayors and decision makers on the local level. We are equally convinced about the importance of the relationship and collaboration between a city and its arts festivals. There is a necessity for festivals and cities to connect to connect with each other in order to give communities a temper, a spirit, a faith, a soul. Hence, we started in 2018 with an initiative we call the Festival Cities Initiative. It seems that cities' policies are changing at the moment, even more so after Corona or with Corona. The city becomes again more a city of the people and maybe less of mobility, as research says about the latest urban policy developments. And we see the city is a place to be and to live with a car-free zone, with green fields, with playgrounds, with arts in its center. As the head of sponsorship yesterday said in our last Zoom meeting, um, society, the people, the inhabitants of a city, the communities, they are the new stars of the city, not the big names anymore. Festivals connect in this development with the city at its heart. They give the color. They drive innovation and social cohesion, personal and societal well-being. They reinvigorate public spaces, attract business to cafes, restaurants, hotels, and increase visibility to the rest of the world. Festivals, festivals elevate community pride and build up the reputation of the city as one with a heart and a soul. Festivals today are invited to develop new initiatives in this trend. They are not guests of a city, but co-host and co-initiator of a resilient, sustainable city. This series of meetings between cities and festivals is our invitation to dialogue about the redesign of sustainable policies after COVID. It is about increasing the group of festivals and cities to work together towards the goal that the arts play a more prominent role in the future of cities' development strategies. It is a first of a series of Friday lunch sessions that step out of the pure festival business into the surroundings of festivals. We would like to enter the connection phase rather than stay in the analysis and positioning phase. Because we all know festivals are severely hit. Many may not survive. The arts and creation is at risk, avant-garde under threat. We, also together embrace the, we all together embrace the idea that art is a necessity. There is no city without the arts. And that is why I'm very, very glad that we have three pioneers, three pioneering cities, city representatives here with us today as our dialogue partners. I think it is not evident for cities to speak up for arts and culture. Look at all the manifestos and proposals flying around about the future of culture and the arts. But I'm convinced that we need flagships like you and your city to give a good example. Let me conclude with some practical information. We planned a session to last 75 minutes. We will have three presentations, each of them followed by a Q&A. Uh, please use the chat for any question that you would like to address to the speakers or to colleagues. Um, and we have two moderators I would like now to introduce and give the floor to. One is, or the main moderator is Sophie de Tremery. She is the director of the World Choir Games in Belgium and has run various festivals in smaller and bigger cities uh, in Europe. 
and Christina, Christina Farinha, one of the most, and sorry to say that, Christina, eloquent experts when it comes to cultural cities. Um, she is, amongst others, uh, a member of the committee of the European Capital of Culture Selection Group. I'm very happy to have both of you as our moderators, and I'm now giving the floor to Sophie, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Catherine. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody. Nice. We are all getting together today. Um, we have been talking on this platform um, amongst festival um, makers, festival directors uh, for the couple of uh, last for the last couple of weeks. Um, but today is very important because we open up um, the talking the talkings to our um, most important stakeholders, the cities where we operate in. And uh, I'm so happy that we have um, uh, a dialogue with our friends uh, today in uh, cities um, that are led by people uh, who have a heart for culture, who uh, chase the same goal, namely culture, seeing culture as the motor of um, the urban development. And then today's central question um, is, uh, how do we put the festivals at the heart of the city's recovery policy? How can culture be the core for rebooting societies? That is what we're going to focus on today. And therefore, we need a dialogue between the cities and the festivals, of course. So um, we will start today with uh, input from the cities of Bergen in Norway, Krakow, Poland, and Rome in Italy. And uh, there are three important um, subjects that will be tackled by each of them uh, as they have prepared uh, their uh, talking for today. The first part, the first subject is that um, culture is in most countries and cities not the number one on the priority list of the recovery plan. So I'm very curious to hear how uh, the three cities of today work uh, with this or around this and if we can learn about their advocacy actions that they uh, have been undertaking so far. The second important subject is uh, about cultural economy. How can we improve the financial and the organizational um, resilience of festivals? Uh, which financial support comes from cities or from a national level uh, in these um, super challenging times? And the third one is, as we are now on a digital, digital uh, platform, the rush to digital um, offers, of course, some opportunities. I think we discovered them in the meantime uh, in terms of reaching new audiences, for instance, or uh, new marketing tools. But um, it also comes with challenges, um, such as how do you pay the artists uh, that are uh, performing on the platform? Or how about the nature of the cultural product that is mostly a live performance? Uh, it disappears partially uh, on, a, on, on digital platforms. So how does this affect the role of festivals um, in cities? But most importantly, and I'm very, very happy about that, is that IFA is continuing a conversation uh, with cities, and that is already the case since more than two years, um, by uh, building a group of pioneers, the pioneers of uh, today, that will invite more cities to join thinking and acting together. I think we need to uh, work together more closely. So today we start with um, three important cities with, who have each of them a great cultural DNA, in Rome, Krakow and Bergen. I welcome Mr. Luca Bergamo, the deputy mayor of Rome. For Krakow and Poland, uh, the, uh, we have the honor to have Robert uh, Piaskowski here, and he's also deputy mayor. And we also welcome Katrin Nodved, the commissioner for culture for the city of Bergen in Norway. The first speaker of today is Mrs. Katrin Notved from Bergen. And um, earlier this week, the International Bergen Summit was held digitally, of course, uh, in the presence of the Prime Minister, the Minister of Culture and the Mayor of Bergen, and of course, Anders, who we all know very well from the Bergen Festival. Katrin said during this summit, culture is at the core of the post-corona policies. Norway could be a fantastic laboratory, sorry, laboratory <laughs> for the new ways of operating and implementing change, also in the arts. We should be confident and work together. Catherine, may I give you the floor? Thank you so much, Sophie. Uh, and it's very nice to be here. I'll just try to get my PowerPoint slides uh, up on the shared screen. Here we go. So now you see the slides, right? Yes. Great. Uh, 
Hi everyone, uh, my name is Katrine Nettvedt. Uh, I'm um, the Commissioner of Culture, Diversity and Equality in the city of Bergen. I'm pretty new as a politician. Uh, I started in this job, uh, which is my first uh, work really in politics in uh, October last year for the Green Party. Uh, so uh, I'm a, a newcomer not only to this forum, but uh, to this job uh, uh, in, as a whole. Um, and, but of course, I'm, uh, as a citizen of Bergen, I'm very familiar with the, the cultural DNA of our city and uh, I'm a, a fond lover of, uh, of festivals in general. I actually met my husband at the Rockwerkter uh, festival uh, <laughs> back in the day. So uh, that, uh, it's a fun, uh, that's a fun coincidence. Um, but I'll jump over to, to this presentation. Just to give a short introduction to Bergen as a festival city, um, we have as a, as a part of our city's master plan, uh, we've defined as goals that we want our city to be an active and attractive city. And this means uh, among other things that recognizing the arts and cultural abilities to make Bergen a good place to live and reside in and increasing the inhabitants participation in the community uh, is important to us. Bergen should be a safe city that is tolerant, inclusive and open to all. And the city government also works towards making Bergen the most sustainable and green city in Norway, highlighting Bergen as a driving force in the region and in the nation. The festival market has become increasingly important uh, as a part of Bergen's cultural life. Over the past five to ten years, there's been a steady increase in both the number of festivals and their audiences, and the market is becoming increasingly more professional and organized. The festival format works very well in Bergen, and the festivals represent both innovation and ensuring the city's relevance and attractiveness, both nationally and internationally. The festivals have an important role as tradition bearing, identity building and ever evolving arenas. And with regards to becoming the, the greenest city also uh, and uh, kind of driving green, uh, green city development in our region, uh, festivals are really important in order to, to increase attractiveness to make people actually want to live in the city. Because around our city we have other municipalities which uh, don't always have the same uh, focus on environment in their planning, in their urban policies. Uh, so also in order to uh, avoid people settling in, in a less environmentally friendly way um, around the cities, we also need to have uh, a lot of activity and cultural vibrancy um, in the city. So as a green politician, that's something that's important to me. The festivals also have major social and economic impacts in Bergen. In addition to creating jobs and supporting the cultural industry, they give the city a comparative advantage in attracting visitors and also people who want to live here. Bergen festivals are spread out throughout the year, uh, but the main bulk is between May and October. Within the professional independent festivals, music festivals still make up the majority of the festival market. At the same time, there are many well-run and stable festivals within most disciplines, actually. Despite the broad festival offerings, most of the festivals are very pointed and have a distinctive program and audience. And there's quite little competition between the festivals and in genres. Bergen has a large and very competent amateur culture scene. Uh, this field is made visible through the year in different local neighborhood festivals, cultural days and street markings. These are also important expressions of the vibrant amateur cultural life and events that happen close to where people live. Many diehard volunteers work diligently in this field and create joy and experience uh, for other inhabitants. There are large city-wide public events also, where the city plays an important role uh, in cooperation with the broad cultural sector and together with private actors. Bergen's history as an important port city also makes us a natural host for events like the Hanseatic Days and the tall ship races. In 2020, we're also celebrating the city's 950 years jubilee. Here are some a very uh, 
uh, tiny selection of uh, the festival life here. From on the left, we have uh, a picture from um, the biannual uh, art festival, uh, Bergen Assembly. And on the right is the annual Bergen Fest, which is a music festival. So to the very important question raised here today, uh, how to put the arts at the heart. Um, to begin with, I think it's important to note that uh, it's very um, defining to have already existing uh, city policy and identity uh, around culture in this crisis. So uh, when moving into negotiations about uh, how we should spend crisis emergency funding in the local uh, politics, uh, it was, there was no discussion about supporting the, the cultural sector or not. It was kind of taken for granted. And I think uh, that has to do with uh, our, our kind of identity as a culture city uh, to begin with. So that kind of laid the groundwork for putting uh, culture at the core and also uh, the festivals as a part of that. Um, during the pandemic, we have, as a lot of other cities and nations have seen, seen the loss of festivals, arts and cultural offerings in general. This has contributed to uh, empty and empty feelings and uh, has darkened our communities and public areas. Festivals have great significance to the life and atmosphere of the city, people's movement patterns, feelings of belonging and identity, etc. The festivals in Bergen that were planned for this summer have for the most part been able to cancel the program and cancel most of the cost or move some of the program to next year um, with the help of force majeure regulation. Um, communication with the local and national government has been crucial for the festivals in this period. The festivals have been able to express their needs and concerns and the local and national governments have replied with targeted measures as fast as possible. I have to give a lot of credit to Han Christian Tolden and the administration in the city department for culture because they've been extremely attentive and caring from the very beginning of the crisis about the needs and challenges of the sector, uh, which has helped, of course, me, uh, guided me as the, the leading politician in this area. To, to be attentive and to be in contact constantly with the, the, both the large and small players in our city. Uh, we've initiated several meetings and we've organized uh, the flow of communication so that we were pretty well informed about the status for our uh, cultural actors from the get-go of the crisis. And this resulted in um, us being able to design the, uh, a package of emergency funding uh, in a pretty uh, targeted way. So um, in Bergen, because we were uh, lucky and I would say very lucky to have a pretty solid uh, economy in the municipality in this crisis, we've been able to put together a package of emergency funding also for the cultural sector. Um, and uh, in the cultural sector, this has been um, directed towards the following measures. Uh, maintaining all public funding to organizations, even if the planned program had to be cancelled or changed or moved. We have launched a new grant scheme for projects that can be implemented with the current uh, COVID-19 restrictions. So that could be either digital projects or analog projects um, that could um, be um, put into place even with the restrictions. We've also launched an investment or loan fund for the commercial cultural industry um, directed at businesses that would not qualify for regular loans. Um, so with, ben, with good conditions and, and uh, providing some both project investment and kind of good hearted loans to music industry, um, film industry and so on. We've also launched an extraordinary, uh, or yeah, at least a special grant scheme to cover fixed expenses and lost revenue during the COVID-19 crisis. The grant also is designed so it can cover expenses for organizations that want to develop their operations and help equip them uh, to better meet 
uh, this or other challenges in the future. Um, so uh, when we were able to put together this uh, package, this means we could be also more uh, specific and more legitimate in our uh, lobbying and our critiques and, and wishes towards the national level of government. Um, the national level of government has been uh, also providing some, some uh, help to the cultural sector in Norway, but I would say um, much less targeted, much more narrow, and uh, they have not been able to be very sensitive to the different needs of the cultural sector. So it's been uh, just covering one small part of it. Uh, so, uh, of course, I hope that our um, suggestions and our uh, messages to the national level will help, but, uh, but uh, so far we, we're not really seeing the results of the advocacy. But, of course, we're happy that our own uh, measures seem to be successful. So, um, over to the economic consequences and how uh, that's playing out in our city. Cancelling the festivals have uh, had major impact on several connected businesses and artists in our city. Taking the example of the Bergen International Festival that was scheduled May to June. The festival is the largest of its kind in the Nordic countries and engages a large part of the art scene in Bergen for two weeks every year. Cancelling the festival uh, completely would mean no income in the concert halls, theatres and other venues, no salaries to artists, technicians, project staff, etc. No revenue for hotels, restaurants, bars, uh, everything that lives around this. So a major impact for the economy and um, not just in the art sector. On the positive side, uh, we've seen a great effort of innovation in the festival markets not everything has been closed down. Within a few days after the Norway went into lockdown, several new digital festivals appeared in the city and were online with an impressive artistic program and were followed, I think, by uh, several hundreds of thousands of audience, uh, even with minimal time for marketing and so on. So that's very, very impressive. In addition to showing the collaborative spirit that we're very proud of in Bergen in the art field, this also shows the will and ability of festivals to innovate and connect with audiences. Uh, regarding the Bergen International Festival, they have actually relaunched an entire digital program, uh, which they organized in a matter of weeks, and will present a 60-point program digitally in the same period as the original festival. That's ongoing now, so you're all invited to check it out on fib.no. At the same time, as the digital development is accelerating, we see parallel developments where the digital merges with the analog performances. It's a new form of creation, dissemination, and experiencing the arts that we would believe will evolve further and be more used in the future. As an example, uh, our internationally acknowledged contemporary dance company, Carte Blanche, have been performing in the backyards of nursing homes uh, in that way, I think they've started putting themselves, if not more, at the heart, um, at least in a different part of the heart of the city. Uh, so the crisis, I think, can have pushed some of the cultural actors and institutions to become interesting, relevant and uh, visible to a different part of our citizens. And that, I think, is very, very interesting. And we have to build on that moving forward. So, and a final perspective, um, as I mentioned, the goals of the city government is to be a very, um, the most green city in Norway. Uh, we want to be fossil free in 2030 and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Bergen by 50% within 2023 compared to the 1991 level. In April, the city government launched a new grant scheme for festivals seeking to reduce their emissions and become more sustainable. This includes greenhouse gas emissions related to events and activities within arts, culture, sports and outdoor life in Bergen. And uh, the emission cuts can be related to indirect emissions such as waste reduction and increased recycling uh, or direct emissions resulting from traveling. Mm -hmm. So when the festivals reopen in the fall or the next year, 
this may be relevant for them to evaluate and to use to restructure their operations and ambitions to become more sustainable than, than before. Katrin? Yes. Yes, <laughs> thank you so much. I think you gave us a very nice overview uh, of what's happening in the city of Bergen in terms of advocacy, financial measures, um, new formats, and uh, the goal of a greener festival life as a part of a big uh, green plan. Um, but what I'm wondering is, um, what do you actually would like to see coming from festivals um, to help you out with all of these uh, goals that you have? What what practical um, things do you expect from us or from I mean from the festivals in Bergen then but then that we can transpone to to the others yes um, well what I see moving forward is that maybe uh, the cultural sector as a whole uh, and I think society as a whole has been developing uh, with a greater and greater pace uh, with more shifts and following trends as quickly as possible Mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder if that might not have to change in order to reach our sustainability goals. But I don't necessarily think that that will make our cultural life uh, less rich and interesting. So what I would like to see is um, what do the festivals uh, think or what can they do to continue international collaboration uh, mm -hmm. without necessarily having to be physically in the same place uh, or maybe bringing in um, different artists for every festival. Can we collaborate more so that audiences in the, in the whole of Europe yes. can get high quality culture, but maybe um, not everybody working from their own city, if you understand. Well, I think that is a perfect question that we can open up to everybody who is here uh, present. Anyone? <laughs> Come on, someone has to have an idea on how to collaborate internationally without uh, physically mo moving. This is the core question for all of us. Without moving, it's the digital. digital. Yes, yes, please. Uh, um, I think that um, now uh, more than ever, we have a necessity to, to exchange uh, exact ideas not just general uh let's say statements that we all need to work together and uh let's say life versus digital could be now replaced with analog and or life and digital so for me more precious in all these discussions would be to have exact proposals and or exact uh, good cases best practices which I also, I have some ideas which i ready to share. I just uh, need some platform, not, not during the, this exchange of, uh, not live uh, uh, session, but maybe to send it to some platform where it could be picked up and discussed and maybe some people could join. So my proposal is to create it on maybe EFA uh, could take the initiative of creating such platform where people could just uh, splash their ideas onto it so and ex uh, expect some reactions and uh, 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 let's say confirmations of collaboration mm -hmm. yes uh, laura i heard you saying something too may i say something yeah. um well um laura maybe first and then fabrizio yeah thank you Sorry, no, I just said that the best way without moving was the digital way everybody's been uh, communicating, Zoom concerts, virtual concerts. Uh, without moving, um, I think it's the only way now. Countries who have a lot of artists um, in their country, like Italy, France, Germany, uh, all the countries who have a, a big concentration of artists are luckier than others because they can do like a festival in Italy with only Italian artists and they will have a big variety and fantastic quality, for example. Other countries are not as lucky and they need to uh, bring artists from all over the world. Yes, thank you. Fabrizio? I am Fabrizio Grifasi, the director of Rome Europa Festival. Um, first, thank you for this opportunity. 
because this uh, serious of meeting of uh, EFA is always very challenging and important for each of us. Uh, I will just briefly bring you the Rome Europe experience in this moment and also what we are planning. Um, first, we have been part of a project that has been launched by the city of Rome and I'm sure Mr. Luca Bergamo will introduce you. Uh, this was an important uh, digital program that the city asked all the cultural institutions of Rome to be part just after the lockdown, so mid-March. Each of us was asked to be part of a weekly program to share with the audience. This is the first part. The second part that we are doing, and that we have a huge archive of uh, more than 1,000 titles during 35 years of the festival. And we are developing a big project with the artists, asking them to give us the possibility to share part of these archives, more are full-length performances that are beautiful. There is from William Kendridge to Trish Brown, historical project, there's some more recent. That's what we are going to develop in the coming months. But the real challenge is exactly what we are discussing now, what we are going to do uh, during the Roma Europa Festival in the fall. Because just at the beginning of this week, uh, the government, the Italian government announced that some measures for theaters that will restrict the attendance of the audience, only 200 person, including the artist and the technician in each theater, even if the theater is 1,000 seats, uh, there will be a problem of international circulation. Um, there is a, an unclear uh, prescription concerning the artists performing on the scene. If they should be at kind of a distanciation, that will mean that it will be not possible to have uh, group performances on stage. Uh, at the moment, it's like this. We, we hope it is going to change, but this is the, 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 the situation. In the meantime, the government allowed the, 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 the organizer to organize shows in open air for 1,000 persons. And this is a, a, a huge possibility. So for Rome Europa, we have been confronted with this situation. And the system that we are planning for the moment is first to support the local and Italian companies, because I think that is our duty and it is very important in this moment. Uh, to maintain all the co-production and as far as possible to maintain all the engagement. The second is to create a new mix project that will include um, live performance with live streaming and online performances that is going to be commissioned and created exactly for this, uh, uh, for, for the online. That's exactly what is we are experimenting for example, with uh, supporting and rebroadcasting some projects that are coming in during those days from Muzum Tour, Camp Nagel, and other European uh, theaters. I think the main challenge for this year is going to be like this, is like to understand what will be the, the, the prescription for the governments, uh, stay near the artist, first to the artist of our city and our uh, country, and if it is possible to welcome international artists, maintain the co-production because we have to still maintain our international engagement with all the artists and to create a new kind of model that will also commission work specific for the online. Thank you, Fabrizio. Um, uh, maybe uh, I can hand over the floor to uh, Christina for a last question to Catherine. Um, about uh, the relationship between festivals and um, cities. And then uh, we uh, need to move over to the next uh, speaker because we still have quite an agenda for today. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Sophie and Catherine and Ifa for the opportunity also to jump into the conversation. Um, uh, Catherine, um, I mean, the issue is indeed, or the elephant in the room is indeed how we're keeping on with our international uh, collaboration. Um, and in the case of, of Nora and Bergam, uh, I mean, you are not EU member, but you have been always very supportive and a very active participant in European cultural cooperation. Uh, how, how can the international community now thinking more and more, um, more in terms of the community and the, the European cultural networks, how can uh, Europe uh, as a community be important to you 
a policy maker, a city. Uh, how can that help uh, uh, not only in defending the importance of culture and, and the role, but also uh, imagining and reimagining and interfering in terms of also the conditions and all these restrictions, uh, the this contexts that we are setting for, for arts to operate? How can Europe and the community be of help uh, to you? Thank you. Um, I think uh, this meeting is an example <laughs> of uh, how Europe can uh, can be uh, a part of our thinking um, because uh, uh, it certainly brings it into my head and I think um, uh, this is uh, this is an example. Uh, so by organizing these kinds of digital uh, meetings, I think we can um, go a long way uh, by setting an agenda that is common for different countries. Um, but I also think we should uh, continue to collaborate in, uh, in all levels, in, like among festivals and among artists. We should continue to also meet in person when we, when we can, um, but perhaps uh, at kind of a slower pace than before. But contact is, is how we can help each other and, and build trust and collaboration. Yes, thank you. Um, I uh, suggest we move on to the next uh, speaker uh, of today, which is uh, Robert Piaskowski, Deputy Mayor of Krakow in Poland. Um, you say that festivals are the city's creative DNA. I think it's a wonderful sentence because it says it all. It says that we are at the heart of uh, what happens in the city. And, um, your goal is uh, to create a closer bond between festivals and cities in terms of management. You go one step further than uh, exchanging, actually. So I'm very um, cre uh, curious to hear what uh, you have to say. Please, the floor is yours, Robert. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to thank you to have me here. And uh, it's obvious that facing the coronavirus crisis could prove to be a significant moment for Europe and Europeans, a moment when people really understand how important it is to have friends who support each other, uh, a moment of sharing vital information, expertise and supplies, a moment when we really realize how a fundamental crisis can be managed much better for cooperation and solidarity. And of course, this prolonged concerns about organizational and ecological possibilities uh, makes the future of our festivals in Krakow also dangerously uncertain. Mm, we are, while I think it's relatively easy to rebuild um, national and then international tourism, it will not be possible for the festival to fully recover or in some cases even survive uh, without state or also European uh, support. Uh, let me share my short presentation. Uh, um, minutes, uh, Robert. Yeah. Can, you, can you see this? Oh, wait. Uh, I don't see it yet. It's here. Can you see it? Yeah, it's coming up. Yes, we see it. Thank you. We believe that our festivals are locally grounded, but globally oriented. And it's absolutely what you, Katrin, said, that inhabitants are quite new stars in this process and we also believe that inhabitants of Krakow are our main uh, target, main audience uh, and, and I will present some proof for this. Today uh, um, in a special way we have to emphasize a few very important things. The close relationship between festivals and the social economy, it's not so obvious in Poland. I can ensure you that uh, speaking about the economic impact of festivals in Poland is very important narrative. Then the close relationship between festivals and the social economy, that's also something uh, we need to learn here in Poland because we used to treat festivals um, as something um, as an addition to our regular cultural life. 
And then uh, the fact that their very existence is the precondition for social regeneration, and they are very important for the future of creative industries, leisure industries, or even um, tourism. And then they are platforms for European values. And, and what Katrina said already, that they are great tools to promote some in, important social changes, also responsibility for the planet, responsibility for the art sector in general. And it's what we see how um, many of Krakow's festivals started to share their resources with local uh, artists or a little um, non-institutional private theaters and so on. I wanted to just to say that it's important also to be connected. And for me, it's a big privilege and it's always inspiring to listen to you and, and share ideas and being if a city network um, uh, member is quite, quite a big thing us, but also being in the UCCN network, ICORN City, European Capital of Astronomy, or being leader of OWHC, it shows us that we can uh, take some ideas and say, say, take some inspirations from, from outside. Uh, as you see, Krakow's festivals, they, they represent all of the creative sectors, all of the arts, they are all year round. Uh, I counted there is 256 festival days in Krakow. So it's quite the whole year, of course, not now. And when, when it comes um, to festivals, Krakow boasts about 100 regular events, festivals with great traditions. One is even 200 years old. This is Midsummer Night Festival. And then some of them are the most popular 30 years uh, established 30 years ago, and was very connected with the transformation of Poland's political system and then subsequent accession into EU. So, uh, city allocates 5% of its culture. It's, it's, it, Krakow is a leader in Poland. Regularly, it's 2%, 3%. So, Krakow it was really champion in allocating such, such amount. And then, um, for festivals, it's not maybe much because it's just 12 million euros, but it um, it has an impact of 125 million euros per year, and and we have 6,000 jobs in the festival sector. So it's quite impressive uh, in figures, and the total audience of Krakow's festival is about 2 million people. 80 percent are um, inhabitants. What is interesting, we have a strong municipal agency called the Krakow Festival Office. Uh, it is in charge of festivals. However, most of the festivals are organized by NGOs and then 10% only are private uh, festivals here in Krakow. Of course, the question is how to feed, how to maintain such an ecosystem how under the current circumstances protect jobs in this sector but also such a crazy saturation of events in our uh, city it's all under the questions um, and of course the pandemic situation um, has shown also some um, some um, uh, weaknesses of current system. Uh, of course, uh, the first decision was quite radical due to the current uh, situation and that there is no possibility to organize festivals in 2020. The regular grants has been cut, reduced to 40% of it. Those 40% were to maintain structures, to maintain uh, jobs, but could not be spent for programs, for travels, for hotels. And then also we didn't agree to move some of the events to the autumn because the autumn has been already enough packed. But that was a very radical decision. But in the same time, other forms of support were launched for festivals, government assistance, EU uh, aid in the form of microcredits uh, to be implemented in the near future to a shield program to protect jobs. And then some of the festivals, as I mentioned, decided to share their budgets with, with artists, with, with freelancers. And that was quite 
a really impressive decision. Um, what uh, seems to me a very positive and particularly interesting side effect of uh, lockdowns is the, is the fact that um, festivals have finally started to talk to one another. That was amazing. They met a few weeks ago on Zoom for the first time and they saw each other for the first time. And not only in Krakow, but all over Poland, uh, 400 most important uh, Polish festivals wrote a few days ago a letter to Polish government with concrete demands and proposals. Um, so it was um, interesting to uh, to be part of this process and there is some few uh, concrete recommendations first of all presence of festivals representatives in negotiations with government uh, um, in uh, in the next stage of unfreezing society and the economy festivals perspectives should be taken under consideration and together with representatives of the uh, festival sector there should be uh, clearly defined sanitary regime and safety measures for all of the participants so that was a strong position of the festivals then establishing a compensation uh, subsidy fund uh, and low interest loans for festivals from the national development fund which will allow us to compensate for shortages and losses caused by new sanitary regime, new sanitary restrictions. Then uh, creation of incentives and tax deductions system for potential sponsors, because we don't have such regulations in Poland. We believe that some of the businesses can be more willing to help festivals, uh, especially there where festivals are connected with local businesses. Then um, we would like to propose to the government the creation of a special festivals development fund on the Canadian model, where um, this fund could be financed similarly to Canadian funds with a percentage from tourism tax. And then um, creation of a grant mechanism for the development of festivals, but not uh, by Ministry of Culture, Minister of Culture is paying for programs, for, for cultural assets, but we would like to have special tools from Minister of Development uh, to protect structures, employment, business models. That, that was one of the um, uh, um, uh, suggestions also. And then, of course, um, uh, strengthening the uh, mechanism of multi-annual funding for festivals. In Poland, they always compete every year competing for grants. We need to really ensure the position of festivals for long uh, term. And of course, uh, you mentioned, uh, Sophie, what is our main goal is to be together, to use this momentum to integrate festivals, to create sort of joint management, to find new business models, to, uh, to use this momentum and this synergy of festivals for political reinforcement. And also we uh, included strategy for the development of festival city in the program of resilient culture program. So it means that we will work together with festivals on the program of resilient culture, how to use potential of the festivals, such a force, two million people, uh, 6,000 people employed to change also uh, our city in a very positive uh, way. And what is also interesting, festivals representatives, they sit together with tourism office and and they shape together a new uh, paradigm for sustainable uh, tourism uh, agenda strategy uh, beforehand they were split as well tourism just they were selling auschwitz Wielitschka salt mine and tatra mountains never festivals. now they ask us please help us to to run tourism in our Town. So I think it's a very important moment where we can expand uh, the importance of the festivals and re reinforce uh, European solidarity and uh, idea of Europe as a shared public space. Uh, we of course will need more funds, not for programs only, but for structures, for 
for um, representation, for models, for legal issues, uh, to create um, uh, festivals uh, ecosystem more re resilient. But as you said at the very beginning, Sophie, we really believe that festivals are the city's creative DNA, and I think it's a deep to Europe as well. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, I think uh, what you said was uh, that crisis brings um, brings us all together, brings the sector together, and brings the sector and the city together. Um, but um, that maybe we should try to find out some more um, systems in which we have a, a better contact. Or and a crisis is always a perfect moment to create that kind of system, and then it can uh, stay alive afterwards. Um, there is uh, someone who wanted to speak already <laughs> before uh, Robert came up. So I would like to give the floor to Notker to react um, on this or maybe on the speaker before. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm calling from Berlin and I'm envious to Krakow since they do a lot more than Berlin does for its festivals. We don't spend 12 million a year for festivals. We recently decided to put 4.5 million into festivals and our government was so stupid to cut it because of Corona and down to zero because they said, oh, there are no festivals during this crisis, so we don't need any funding. So they didn't understand anything because I see it, Robert, I can underline 100% what you were saying. Um, I think it's, it, it's a chance and it shows how vital and how important festivals are that they shape the city. Um, Berlin has its Berlinale as a film festival. Um, we couldn't think without it. And, and I think that will become more important. And while digital is needed and necessary and keeps our visitors um, interested, um, Corona shows us that the real festival cannot be digital. It has to be analog. We have to visit the city. We have to come to the city. So um, what was mentioned in the beginning, I think it's... Um, uh, festivals are um, necessary for any city and being a green politician in Berlin I'm, I'm trying to stress that more and um, I'm really happy that there is a network like this and I think Europe will uh, realize that uh, maybe even through that crisis that the um, diversity of festivals we have is basically what our yeah, that, that's our cultural um, uh, background, that's what Europe is about so I'm I think once we get over this, festivals become much more important and I'm grateful for getting more connected. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Thank you Anatkar. Um, Christina, my co-host, any question? <laughs> Well, uh, thank you, Sophie. I will actually voice, uh, because it's also my function here today, uh, I will also voice uh, one of the questions uh, of the chat that I think fits here uh, after this intervention uh, that was concerned uh, uh, with European values and also the Polish situation. So, of course, the question is, is for Robert. Uh, how can actually, in, in this situation where uh, we are, uh, uh, let's say, restrained to work with local artists, uh, uh, even though, uh, of course, international ones can communicate and can perform and we can access that online, uh, with, uh, talking about uh, the importance of, of, of criticality and uh, uh, live uh, uh, relation of, from audiences to, to artists, uh, how can we actually uh, uh, keep on uh, fostering and expecting that uh, European values and European cooperation will uh, become or uh, continue meaningful if we are resumed to our local or, or, or national uh, uh, communities? Robert. I think that's uh, very important what you mentioned and also I'm very glad that, that we will be able also to apply for some of European culture or, or, or of solidarity fund. I, I don't know if you, if, you, if you all know about this, but it's a fund about um, expanding the notion of Europe as an open and public space for everyone to share experiences, knowledge, skills, stories, ideas, but also uh, create new alliances across sectors to deal with the current challenges caused by uh, the crisis. And this is what we exactly do uh, here right now. 
And uh, I also uh, I wanted to mention about this digital world because some of our festivals has been really um, prepared for, for such a circumstances we are suffering now. Some of them they got recordings, whole concerts, wonderful productions they've been recording over the years, and they did never shared this because they were always waiting for momentum or for the creation of a specific platform, or they got no money to, to create sort of Netflix of the festivals. Uh, and now there is a time we establish sort of platform for Krakow festivals, but also all of the cultural institutions pa uh, financed from public resources. This platform name will be Play Krakow, and we will get, uh, we will um, help institutions, festivals to clear rights uh, back if they are cleared. And if it's not possible, of course, we cannot share it online. And the idea is to, to uh, create special fund for audiovisual productions, for recordings, special money for festivals, for theaters, for um, for galleries to to invest into such a way of 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 content, and this content will be in different business view on demand, paid or gratis. It will be also a sort of abonnement. If so, this Netflix uh, comparison is quite uh, quite. Uh, inspiring maybe, uh, but we would like to gather all of the channels, all of the um, uh, organizers uh, around the label, about, around the power of the brand of Krakow, but also due to the fact that most of our festivals and institutions are financed from the same source, public source, so we would like to create common space on the internet where all those, um, uh, all those uh, cultural crack will be accessible. Because my concern is that we have also so much digital trash in, on the internet. Uh, there won't be, in, in one, year, one year, no one will find this content, which is live streamings. Or, so we need to think also about the digital world as, as a solution and potential to to raise money and to uh, yeah maybe we won't have success like berliner philharmoniker that they 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 collect from streaming uh, of the concerts around 30 percent of their budgets or metropolitan opera as well but even if there will be few persons from from a view on demand which could support festivals or cultural programs or even this audiovisual found like to set that will be something really interesting okay thank you uh, i think it's time to move on to the third speaker of today and uh, last but not least i welcome the deputy mayor of rome mr luca bergamo um, also you have uh, set up um, a cooperation with all the big cities in italy uh, concerning um, culture in this crisis uh, because culture has not only an economical function, but also uh, is needed to strengthen social cohesion, uh, you're right. Um, and um, can international tourism um, that is huge in a city like Rome be replaced by national tourism? I give you gladly the floor. Right, thank you very much. And, and actually, I must say that it's kind of nice to see faces that I knew and worked with in the past. I was, you know, for long years away, mm -hmm. uh, though very interesting years, very challenging. Um, maybe just a few things. Then I, I get in, in the first, in the four question you rose at the beginning, um, uh, as a framework. Uh, the I said the mission I uh, uh, took while I took office here was to switch from uh, um, let's say policy that was based on the idea that culture is uh, goods and services for people's spare time and in support of tourism to uh, uh, the idea that cultural participation is a fundamental human right 
and uh, as it is enshrined in the Article 27 of the UN Right Declaration. For reasons that I, uh, some, of, some of you know, advocated when I was uh, running Culture Action Europe, that relates to uh, a specific uh, uh, period of our societies where uh, the sound, the, the, the rumorous lack of uh, vision for the futures build fears. And on fears, it would be social disruption and very dangerous political phenomena for democracy whatsoever. So uh, the Article 27 was written after the Second World War because they were aware that through the experiences you do by participating jointly to cultural life, you build a social cohesion, social tax capital, cultural competence that allow a society to be such not just a bunch of different communities, one against the other. So we twist everything as much as possible to imagine that whatever was done and was done wonderfully in uh, under many expect had to be conceived, targeted to the city itself, not just to uh, say a market driven mechanism that imagined that the people are coming as tourists, uh, as tourists are part of the business. Uh, this was already somehow in the DNA of the city, but not, uh, no stated, not structurally uh, conceived. Why? Uh, this is a preamble, but I think it's important because what are we uh, experiencing now is uh, the collapse that uh, the fragility of a society uh, where let's say, a market-driven uh, interpretation based on the assumption that private consumption would have ever always growth is uh, simply incapable to deal with the reality we are dealing today. And to my end, one of the challenges, uh, and it's massive challenges, is how to imagine that through this period, we first help the cultural um, operators, reality, people as physical person to survive and th at the same time to reorganize in order to be resilient to challenges of this kind that are inherent uh, to uh, a social a socioeconomical model that I disagree with. So cultural policy to this end are part of uh, a policy that imagine that human development is a core of an economic model and not the contrary. That is somehow doable in Rome to some extent because they, the implication is that now we need a strong public finance that come into the cultural sector. And one of the challenges you were questioning, we are raising how do you advocate for uh, whenever you know, public funding is cut, we know by experience that cultural funds are among the first to be reduced. Uh, so I said my position is on the contrary that we, uh, at the city scale, we should, we have to keep the, the, the public hands in culture as in social uh, services uh, strong and possibly stronger than it was before while the uh, taxes income are falling down. This is first everything. We, uh, we have, uh, you know, Unfortunately, a smaller percentage of the city budget compared to Krakow. Anyway, it's 2.5% that amounts to 150 million euros per year. That uh, goes on two lengths. One is heritage and the other one is cultural activity. And, uh, so cultural activity, we, we spend uh, around 74 million euros per year. Uh, all CD festivals are produced, or the major festivals, so with the exception of one that is a music festival, are produced by entities that are either owned or participated 
by the city. At different level, one of among those I'm more proud as citizen, not as a deputy uh, as well, it's uh, uh, Romarova, which by the way is the one that's getting less money <laughs> from us than in compared to the others, but is an extraordinary experience in the city that we have to, no, we protected uh, uh, as much as possible. So first measure we took was to confirm the commitment, the financial commitment we had at the beginning of the year and, and disconnecting in, uh, uh, to any, uh, let's say, ob obligation in fulfilling the objective of the year. That means that whatever happens, the structure that gives life to the Roma Rapa Festival, uh, Literature Festival, National Graphic, Geographic Science Festival, Cinema Festival, whatsoever, and the Hobbit House or whatever, they will get the public funding that was committing at the beginning of the year. That's, it's a financial measure. It doesn't solve the problem, but it gives a little bit of breath to the institution. At the same time, we have been advocating with the national government to have a measure taken by the national government that goes in the same directions. Uh, then we have in included, adopted flexibility. Uh, so for those that were awarded grants, independent operators, so that, uh, and we did a uh, uh, tender for three years. So we work on the three years period. So each, each year now we, you know, we open calls for project the last three years and we award grants that therefore finance culture operators selected through this mechanism uh, for the next three years. We allow them to uh, reorganize uh, the way they want their activity uh, in the year 2020, 20, even decided not to do it by not losing the right to do it in 20 and 21 and doing whatever they can do in this year naturally we are bound to reduce the contribution in proportion to the activity but anyway we allow everybody to reorganize themselves then we work on easing bureaucracy and waiving uh, taxes so just just to, to understand to keep what, what's the measure and as fabrizio was saying thanks to the fact that a few years ago we create a working process that involved these cultural institutions that brought them to produce uh, a wonderful uh, event. I'll show uh, a minute video at the end of things to cooperate in providing, in working uh, with, with the platform, with a digital uh, offer during the crisis, which uh, was uh, which reached 55 million contacts. But naturally, that was for free. And it was for free because, again, there was a public funding, but the same was the opportunity for the institutions to come up with their stock of uh, wonderful things that became available for everybody. Uh, the, the challenge, the true challenge, I mean, the challenge is the question is how long the impact of COVID will last? Because uh, what are we talking now? What I'm talking now is basically the measure you, know, you can put in place at the city scale, and I, I like all the things, in, in a specific model. So we have a model of a city that is structured a certain way, then you have an organization, and other ones are not, Karkov is different, Bergen is different, so each one has to find their own way to deal with. But that it might help to, uh, to have the organization and the people survive, but it doesn't answer to the question, what happens after? What happens tomorrow? And nobody has the answer. No one. One element, and I go back to the first step one, is that we should imagine, let's say, even in terms of markets, that for a while we'll have to address internal markets. Maybe artists will be able to move across the continent hardly across continents, but people will have more challenges. So activity need to be perceived by the people that live in a place where do you do the activity as something that is relevant for them, which is 
certainly the history of festivals, there are certain festivals that are physically in places where people go and are coming across Europe. So challenges really differs from a festival that is enshrined in a, not in, in a city uh, and another one that uh, is in the middle of nowhere and is based on the fact that you gather 100,000 people. So there are really differences. Uh, I'll quickly go on answering a few things. First, uh, how do you make cultural priority? You don't make cultural priority, but you, you fight. What we did here it was to link, I, I put around a table and we advocate together the, the deputies in charge of culture of, of the major Italian cities. And through that, we, uh, we achieved to have a national government measure, measure in favor of the most fragile independent worker in the sector that were not protected by the wealth. We work with the uh, United States local government organization in order to launch an initiative that might bring back the cultural issue in the revision of the SDGs. And then we have to fight within our own administration, and that's it actually is really fight. And the fight implies that the people of the cultural sectors is capable to show the social relevance and the social responsibility that they're on their shoulder by doing what they do. Without that, it's not the economic contribution. It's how cultural life rebuild, reconnect society. Everybody was showing Italian people singing in the balconies. And singing in the balconies was just a way for a community to reconnect each other at the moment that the, the social connection based on you know leaving physical spaces together was cancelled. But this is part of what we what you do and this has to come out strongly visible. The rush to the digital, I agree with whatever was written here. Uh, say that we need to find in person, we keep to find in person experiences. That depends on rules that are normally uh, decided by health authorities. That implies sitting with the health authorities and discussing the rules. What we are doing at the moment, once that the national government has issued the rules Fabrizio was referring, some of those are you know, abstract. I mean, just for, to be clear, the national government decided you can do an event for just 1,000 person for the simple reason to provide to those who organize larger event, a leverage to say that they had to cancel the event for you know, a, a, a law and therefore um, remove the legal responsibility of buying third paying the third parties because of the cancellations. Okay. So, but that makes no sense to the other way. So that there are rules that need to be discussed and we are collecting things in order to rediscuss the rules so to make things possible. And then there's an open air. Uh, finally, there's something that I would uh, share. Uh, in order to making a, a cultural life, uh, um, uh, th there is a, a long lasting uh, competition between uh, you know, culture activity and heritage that should end that should be over because the perception of the value of the contemporary at least in a society that is so strongly impacted by the cultural heritage as europe it also depends by the relationship the contemporary is capable to physically establish with the cultural heritage and the, the, the organization separation and existing, the non-dialogue, it is a weakness in the uh, lobby advocating, uh, advocacy capacity of the sector. Um, that's you know, a word of things to say. Uh, as you know, I could go over. I will not. <laughs> I thank you very much for having given me the opportunity to share things and uh, directly through Fabrizio the other ones be aware as as long as we last in office <laughs> we will be on the same side <laughs> on that that's all thank you
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bergamo. Um, I think you said some very interesting points. And um, uh, as we already um, about at the ending of the session, I would just like to give the floor one more time to uh, to all of you and the festival directors who are here, um, because we've tried to hear what the cities need from us. But uh, maybe there are festival directors who who want to to, to let uh, you know or to, um, Sorry, who, who, what you want, maybe there are festival directors who wants to uh, know what they uh, can have from the cities apart from uh, funding. Because we've been talking a lot about funding, but the question is, can cities do something else for festivals apart from that? And I would like to give the floor to some festival directors if there is anyone who would like to go on this subject. Yes, Eyal. Hi, everyone. Uh, for us, one of the most important things that we expect from the city is to work in a comprehensive way, so as to bring uh, the other stakeholders into the conversation. So it's not just the cultural organizations, but also uh, the education, the tourism, uh, the economy, the uh, community-oriented people, because we see that in the future when we can um, get back into the action, as we all mentioned, a lot of it will come from, um, from the local population and we see a really strong connection with uh, engaging the students, uh, pupils and students, engaging uh, the community, um, not only from the side of uh, the audience that will attend the festival, but also in that the role of art and culture in the healing process of the community, not just the economy, but the individual breakdowns and the community uh, fragmentation and so on. After this isolation, uh, we see we'll have to play a, a very important role and we see a sort of a, a cohesive uh, approach that is necessary um, from the city. In addition, we can't not talk to the, to, uh, touch the funding aspect, uh, the funding must be not only in terms of compensation for loss uh, income, not only compensation for uh, salaries for people uh, and artists while we're uh, on a break, but also what it will take to, uh, to reignite the whole process. When we know that um, ticket prices will have to go uh, significantly down to the level of almost uh, pay as you can, uh, not only to encourage people to uh, entrust themselves in coming back and reconvene, but also having the mean to do it. So those yeah. two things. Okay, thank you. I have uh, Iran who would like to comment and also Christina. So maybe first uh, Iran. Yeah, thank you. Great to be back and also to see people I haven't seen for a while. I'm happy to hear the pay as you can that Festival de Regionen is already implementing is making the rounds in positive ways. Uh, I've been working with a few uh, inventors in the uh, USA who are also looking at designing applications to minimize risk, because I think if we want to reopen up, it's all about minimizing risk. And what we can do with uh, cities or partners is, uh, first of all, um, it, it seems as if it will probably be safer, especially with summer coming to move outdoors. So very unbureaucratic ways to create spaces outdoors for performance. Also, if we are thinking of performing inside, it's about connecting with, uh, uh, you know, the physical space around venues, uh, how much space is there for an audience to go in and out? Um, and uh, do we need to block roads? Also to connect with public transportation. So if you're going, bringing people to a venue or after performance, leaving the venue that not everybody's in the same tram at the same time, there's a theater in Vienna that would be a very high risk group because their subscribers are all over 70. So you would have everybody in one tram. So there are many things that uh, deal with flow of people. How can you get people in and out? Do you make shorter performances and play more than once a day if you're a venue with 900, but only 250 are allowed in? Do you create a, a repertoire of short pieces without break? and then play two or three times. That means you need crowd control. How do you bring 250 people in and out of the theater? 
to mix with the others. So there's going to be a lot of that because I don't think there will be a, a cure or a vaccine very soon. And at the moment, testing is quite, um, quite expensive. The test in Vienna for travelers is 190 euros per test. And it's a three hour wait. That's not very practical when you want to go to the theater. So it's all about how do we, how are we going to minimize risk? And of course, the way to a venue or the surroundings of a venue where cities can be, can be uh, are responsible also, or municipalities also need to be taken into consideration. It's, just a, it's not just about the people in the building at that point. Thank you. Christina? Um, thank you. I would like Luca uh, to, to go back to the to your point on cultural priority, to fight for cultural priority to and taking advantage and following up on, on the on the intervention also before. Do you think that this crisis uh, will finally allow uh, you to sit around the table with your colleagues uh, from other policy areas uh, uh, where we talk we talked about tourism but also education urban planning the social affairs do you think that finally we can uh, um, cl cross that door I mean we've been talking about that for, for long but do you think it finally is it's feasible the, the question, this is a two-faced question. I, I actually do it, and actually in Italy we are doing for strange reason. I mean, I, I'm, I'm the vice mayor technically. That means that when the mayor does not, is in charge, I am in charge as mayor. So I coordinate my colleagues as well. And then we necessarily, let's say there's a political dynamics that leads to this. And as the culture minister in the government is politically strong. On, you know, let's say, on, on the global scale, the, the, uh, despite that, there are always issues that are related to the people perception. That's the problem I, I see is more in what people consider relevant and what consider, what's considered necessary and, and what considered relevant. So one of the challenges is how you expand the constituencies that is not just merely, you know, within the cabinets, but is, uh, you know, among the constituent. Uh, globally, I think that the, you know, the, the, if, I, if I have to judge uh, by the interest that I'm, that the issue is taking uh, among uh, the, the United States and local government, which is the global organization of, uh, uh, of local authorities, to the point that a work that we began uh, a bit before the, 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 the crisis that was working at say a, a charter of the cultural right at city scale is becoming one of the major uh, say policy point for the organization even the dialogue with the United Nations towards the uh, revision of um, SDGs I, I would say that there is a uh, more there's a more perspective. But the point is that when it will go to funding, to public funding, then the weaknesses we will all show up again. So the, the, again, the problem is the, cos, the constituency of the cultural sector cannot be limited to the cultural sector. It has to be, you know, largely the people and the demand that was. Uh, rules before that is instrumental, which is, okay, you local authorities work in a comprehensive way because now uh, we, we need more of you know, the people next to us, even in order to survive, which I take and uh, I think we have to do, or some of us do it actually, but it also has an implication that the organization on the ground some they do it, some not. They consider the reality they are nestled in as a reality towards which they have a social responsibility, whatever they do. And that's not always the case. So you need to, I mean, it's a cultural institutions very hardly do it in certain extents. You need really to make the, the sector, the people, really, really the more and more part of the society. I think. Contemporary art is doing great things by this extent, because that the, all the, the contemporary art that is uh, not specific, what works in uh, not 
in disadvantaged communities and so on is changing the perception of that people of the relevance. You had it in music in Latin America, by example, you no know, things to the experiences. But that is not general. And I think that this is something that is it's not on the authority uh, shoulder, it's on, on the sector shoulder. Then the authority need to provide all the means for those that have the you know, content capacity to survive and do as well this work. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bergamo. Um, I think we can um, conclude uh, this meeting uh, by saying that we just have talked about the like the little top of the whole topic. Uh, also, it was very busy on the chat. Um, and um, uh, therefore, I would like to thank our uh, speakers of today, uh, Mr. Luca Bergamo from Rome, Robert uh, Piaskowski from Krakow, and Katrin Notveld from Bergen. Um, thank you so much. Also, thank you to Kristina Farina from um, European uh, Voice. And um, I think Katrin has um, a continuation of this process uh, in petto for you. So over to Katrin. Thank you all so much for uh, your contributions. Thank you, Sophie, as well, for sharing. Before concluding this meeting, I have a wonderful invitation for all of you, for the cities, for Luca, for Robert, for Katrin, and all the cities that are joining in the next meetings that we are going to organize in a two weeks rhythm um, within what we call the Festival Cities Initiative. Uh, I will give the floor now to Justina. Uh, she's joining us from Adelaide, and she's the co host of the I think the fifth session on the 10th of July. Um, uh, we know, you know that we, this was the first of a series of five sessions. We are going to have the next one dedicated specifically to the topic of cultural tourism uh, and the role uh, of, of festivals, cultural tourism uh, post Corona, which I think is very important to think on the European level and on the global level. Um, and as Sophie said, these meetings are really just a stimulus of thoughts. They can't go much deeper than the stimulus of thoughts, but we are going in the next four sessions to try to go deeper, also in little groups, uh, on specific topics, to go more in depth. Um, today was, I think, a fantastic way to start and to see how Luca, Robert, and uh, Katrin in, in their cities, how they how they are on our side. And that is for us, I think, important. We need to start somewhere with pioneers uh, that are courageous enough to take up and to fight uh, for arts and culture at the local level. And I think uh, there we have something for you, Luca, uh, Robert, and uh, Katrin, that Justina will introduce now all of us in one minute. Christina, uh, Christina, sorry, Justina, do I still have you with us? Because I think it's midnight by now in Adelaide. <laughs> Thanks so much, Catherine, and, and thank you to all those who contributed to this wonderful discussion. Thank you for having me here from Australia. Good evening to, to all of you. Um, picking up on some of the points from the conversation, you know, using numbers to um, measure, communicate, and provide value um, to the festivals continues to be an important way to express their contribution. Uh, however, finding other ways to also express and communicate value is is challenging, uh, and we have come across this challenge during this uh, new COVID reality. And so as part of the Festival Cities Initiative that uh, Catherine has mentioned, uh, we are proposing to launch um, the Festivals Connect social media campaign, uh, which will aim to celebrate the ways in which festivals create connection uh, and amplify a sense of community. Uh, and especially to draw attention to the fact that festivals exist uh, within global circuits, uh, spanning vast networks of artists, audiences, tourists, cities, producers, technical staff, uh, administrators, and, and many more. Here, here in Adelaide, we run um, an organization uh, that I'm CEO of called Festivals Adelaide. We are a coalition of 11 of the major festivals in the city and in the region. Uh, and we are looking for ways uh, to create those connections internationally and to speak with a common voice. Uh, so this campaign will invite festival cities, uh, networks, uh, associations, uh, other festivals around the globe uh, to commission a single and uh, novel image that will express a positive uh, message about the social and community value of festivals, one that recognizes um, 
how we are fun fundamental to the identity and success of urban centers around the world. So Catherine and her team will be, will be sending out more information to all of you soon. Uh, and we hope uh, that you will all participate uh, in this international campaign. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Justina, and thank you, everyone. We see each other hopefully back in two weeks' time, and until then, stay all well. <laughs>